the book of Hebrews. I want you to grab your Bible and I want you to actually turn to Hebrews chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible with you, there is Bibles in those seat backs and those pew backs in front of you. And uh, we're going to Hebrews chapter 11 uh, this morning. We, we, in that, you see that we're skipping a couple chapters there to get into Hebrews chapter 11. But here's the reality. Chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, that whole section of chapters, we, we've been dissecting and, and going through that and, and, and teaching through that. And, and it really has, those four chapters have the same overall um, thought that, it's, that the author is giving there. And it was this. It was basically the, the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that for a couple of weeks. The, the high priesthood of Jesus Christ and, and the old covenant, the old sacrificial temple rituals versus the, the ultimate temple, the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus Christ and, and the new covenant that that comes with. And, and so, so you look at all 7, 8, 9, and 10, and if you, you read through those, you see that that's the, that is the, the theme, that is the thought that the author is giving throughout all of the four of those chapters. So we, we feel like we, we've, kind of, we've kind of dug that out, we've kind of mined that out of the scripture. So we're going to move on to Hebrews chapter 11, where the author begins to talk about faith. Now, remember, all throughout Hebrews, he's talking about that the things that are better than the, the things that they have been putting hold on to. Remember, the author is writing this letter to the, Ju- Judea, to the Jewish Christians, the Jewish Christians, who at this time are really struggling maybe about going back to, to this Judaism. And, and he's beginning to tell them, and remember he's telling them that, that Jesus, he, there's, there's nothing better, that Jesus is the, the superior, Jesus is better. Talking about his high priesthood, his high priesthood is better than. Now, all this, that's kind of the underlying theme. And so here's, we have this, 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 audience who is considering maybe kind of wrestling with going back to this Judaism and beginning to put faith in one of a key figure in Moses and in Hebrews chapter 11 the author says let's talk about faith and let's talk about a superior faith a faith not in man a faith not in earthly things a faith not in visible things that we can put our hands on to but faith in Jesus a better faith See, here's the reality. We all live by faith every single day. We, we don't even realize it. It's just part of who we are. We have faith. We live by faith. We go over to the light switch and we flip the switch, and our faith is that the lights are going to come on. And if for some reason it doesn't catch us off guard, we, we hit the light switch. What, what happened? You, you flip it up and down, and you're thinking, let's flip it up and down. That will make it work, you know? And you're like, okay, well, I didn't, you know, we, 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 we get in our car, we take our, our key, and unless you have one of those nice fancy cars, you push a button now, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and you start your key and you're expecting that car engine to, to start and begin to run, right? We live by faith that that's what, that's what we do, that that's part of who we are. We, we put a letter in the mail and we have faith that I'm going to put it in this box and somehow it's going to get to the place of those Christmas cards. We put all those Christmas cards in that box and somehow we expect that it's going to get all across the, the country to all the people that we want to wish Merry Christmas. It's, it's faith that we have. It's this, it's this trust. But what happens often is that people, we begin to put our faith in the wrong things. That faith, that trust, that confidence, you know? The confidence and the trust that that light switch is going to make a light come on. That faith, that trust, that confidence that me turn the keys on and my engine run. The faith, the confidence that I put my Christmas card in the box is going to get to my loved one in another state. It's, it, sometimes we put faith in, in wrong things because faith, that trust, that confidence is only as valuable in the object that we're putting it in. So the author is beginning to say here, why don't you put faith, your superior faith, in something that is superior, that is better than anything. If you put faith in in Jesus, if you put your faith, your trust, your confidence in Him, that is superior, that is better than anything that is visible, tangible here in this world. There is a, a better faith. So here, here, here's how the Hebrew author starts Hebrews chapter 11. Look with me in verse 1. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for by faith. We understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. All right, so he right here, the author in these first three verses, he says, let me give you a description or a definition of what faith is. He says, faith is being sure of what we hope for. Something that we don't have, something that we don't see, something that we can't put our hands on. You know, if I were to say, man, I, I hope one day 
to have a million dollars. That means that we don't have a million dollars, right? Someday I, I hope to have the, the, this, this dream house of mine. That means that we don't have it. We can't put our hands on it. So he says that faith is being sure or being certain of something that we cannot see, something that we cannot put our hands around. So he's saying here, he's beginning to lay this. Let's, put, let's have our faith, let's, have our, let's be sure, let's have our confidence, let's have our trust in something that's not visible, something that we na- can't right now put our hands on. I love this definition of faith. It's confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. Faith. Confident obedience to God's word in spite of of circumstances and consequences. See, what biblical faith is, biblical faith is that God sees all things, that God has control of all things, that God tells us that there is a reality of something even when we can't see it. That's what faith is. That the reality of something is there even if I can't see it, even if I can't put my hands on it, even if I can't wrap my arms around it, this is something that is real because God had said it. And in the scriptures, I'm putting my confidence, I'm putting my trust and obedience to God's word in spite of the circumstances or the consequences of my life. I love 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. This is what it says. It says, we live by faith and not by sight. In my Christian journey, in this this journey that I'm on as a Christ follower, it says, I live by faith and not by sight. I live by that hope, that anticipation, that trust, that confidence in something and things that I cannot see. But I believe it, I have trust in it, I have confidence in it because God has said it, God has promoted it, God has shown it to me, God, God is saying these things are real, I'm putting my faith into this thing. Not the fact that I, that I, get, that I have to see everything. And I, I, I deal with people and I talk with people all the time. And there's probably times in my life that I've done the same way. Is that I don't want to take steps. I don't want to move forward because I want to make sure I see things. Make sure all my ducks are in a row, right? Make sure that everything is, is situated. I'm not, I'm not going to take I'm not going to do anything until I know that, that everything is good and I can see all the way down to the future. And if I can see it, then, I, then I'm ready to move. Well, faith is going, I'm ready to move even though I can't really see everything. Why? Because of the object my faith is in. My faith is in God. My faith is in Jesus Christ. And in that, I can be confident to move forward. In that, I can be confident to to do. I can be confident and and have trust that these things are reality. But even though I can't see it and put my arms around it, they are reality because God says this. See, to me, faith is this anticipation that the promises of God will come true. That's what faith is to me. Faith, Faith is this hope. And not a hope is that I wish. Man, I, I hope. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of sure. No, it, it's a deeper meaning of hope. It's this anticipation that the promises of God, the things that he's laid out for us in Scripture, his letters to us, his stories to us, his speaking into our life and into our heart and our mind, that these things are true. I can stand on them. I can bank on these promises of God. And when I begin to live life like that, when I begin to look at decisions in life with faith, I begin to look at, 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 at choices in, this, in, in life with faith, I begin to live my life with that kind of faith, that anticipation, that certainty, that, that, that sureness, all of a sudden faith begins to birth action in my life. See, faith, it not only anticipates, it moves. Faith, faith isn't stagnant. Faith is action. To me, I begin to look at that. If I'm truly sure and confident in this, I can move. I I can be busy. I can do because I am am, am putting that confidence, that trust in this. It's like the spark of that engine. To me, that's what faith is. You know, you turn that key, and all of a sudden, there's a spark plug in the engine that spurts up a little fire, a little spark there, and then that ignites the engine to actually get going and actually be moving. If that spark doesn't happen there, what happens? That engine won't start, the car won't move, right? To me, that's what faith is. Faith, faith is that initiator that causes movement. So look at this in our life. My faith, my, my certainty, my trust, my confidence in God causes movement in my life, causes action in my life. It begins to, to cause me to, to, to initiate some movement and some action in the things that I'm doing. The things that I'm saying that I'm about, that's what the rest of Hebrews chapter 11 is about. 
Hebrews chapter 11, he begins to say, hey, the author says, hey, this is a description of what faith is. It's hope, it's certainty in the things that we cannot see. So what is the object of that faith? It better be something bigger and superior than, than anything here on earth. And then he goes and begins to, to lay out what, what kind of some demonstrations of that faith. He begins to look at some, some patriarchs of the scriptures and the patriarchs of the story of God. He begins to say, look at how these people lived out and lived by faith. So look at me. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. And let's just look at all of these demonstrations of faith that the author lists here. He says, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By faith he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when, he called, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah, his wife herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man... He, and he is as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that there were aliens and strangers on this earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared a city for them. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He had received the promises, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's son and worshipped as he kneeled on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instruction about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw in him no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses... When he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Verse 29. By faith, the people, these are the Israelites, by faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon. Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Let's just stop there. A lot of, a lot of reading. But the author just begins to list 
person after person after person. And I want you to catch on what he has said. He started every section about each person with these, these two words, by faith. He says, by faith, these people moved. By faith, their confidence, their trust in a God who was bigger than them and more superior than them. By faith, they did something. Their faith was the initiator to them doing. Their faith was not just the security blanket in their life. Their faith became something that caused action in their life. By faith action by faith they did let's look at some of these not all of them let's look at some of them the author said this noah by faith noah by faith noah built an ark by faith noah when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear built an ark to save his family i love this because it's by faith with things that had not been seen before he obeyed see Noah's action was obedience. By faith, Noah obeyed. This was a project. This was a huge project. You've got to first of all understand that, that the project of building the ark took over 100 years. So here's Noah starting to build this ark for something that has never been seen, as said before. He says, God has given me this assurance. God has told me that to, I need to build this ark. I need to build this huge boat to save my family because the rainwaters are going to begin to come. The floods are going to become. Though the waters are going to begin to rise up and this entire place is going to be flooded. And people looked at him and said, what are you talking about? There's some theologians that, that say it's very possible that at this time, if you study the scriptures and you understand that it may have never had rained out of the skies before. That waters may have just kind of come out of the waters and out of the rivers and out of the lakes. And so all of a sudden, now Noah's saying, yeah, it's gonna, there's going to be water falling from the sky. Seriously, Noah? You were crazy. You're, you're, you're just, and we're nowhere near any water. You're just building this out like here, and they're, they're, you're building this huge boat, whatever. And what, I don't know what you need that for out here. There's no water around it. He says, the earth is going to flood. And for 100 years, can you imagine Noah being mocked? I mean, people walking by his trailer house and looking at a big ark behind it. Like, what is that? That's that crazy guy living down in the corner. That's that. His kids probably getting mocked at school. Oh yeah. Oh, you're Noah's dad. Yeah. Oh yeah. Watch out for those waters. You know. I mean. I mean. They're probably just. I mean. He literally is being mocked. People think he is silly. For a hundred years, he builds this into the obedience of of what it is. And all of a sudden, we know the story. That the rainwaters came. The floodwaters began to rise, and his family was saved. But by faith, Noah did something. By faith, Noah obeyed. He obeyed even when everybody else thought it was silly. In our life, it's pretty easy to obey the, the commands and the directives of God's word when the people around us are supporting us in that, right? But what, would be, what happens when you begin to get mocked about it? What happens when the standards and the values in your life that you set for yourself begin to be questioned by coworkers? Or people begin to say, well, why don't you do that? That's just silly. Well, why, why would you believe that? Why, why do you try to live your life that way? Why, why do you do this? Or why don't you do that? What, do we still obey? Because it's really easy to obey when everyone around us is going, yeah, you're doing a great job. But when you start to get mocked by it, when, you start to, when everybody begins to think that your obedience is silly, do you still obey? Noah did. By faith. By faith, it says here that Abraham... By faith, and we have several examples that, that Abraham is given here. By faith, Abraham, here's what his actions, he trusted and he waited. By faith, Abraham trusted and he waited. God, if you know the story of Abraham, let me give you a quick synopsis of it. God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of great nations. I'm going to give you, you're going to be this, this great father of all the nations of Israel. As a matter of fact, I want you to move. I want you to take your family and I want you to move. Okay, God. Okay, God, where do you want us to move? You know, you want us to move down south, you want us to move up north, east, west, you know, what town? Big city, small city, where, where are we going? He says, I don't really know, I'm not going to tell you yet, but I want you to go move. All right, husbands, can you imagine going to your wife? All right, let's pack it up. We are going to move, and, and I know we got a lot of packing to do, and I know it's kind of hard, we're going to uproot, we're, we're going to move. And first of all, you get over that shock, and first of all, as, as, as husbands, you talk your wife into the move, and she finally says, okay, we'll move. Okay, by the way, where are we going? I don't know yet. 
We're just going to load the car, load the truck, and we're just going to drive until God. Seriously? Okay. You're, but I'm not going. You can pack it up yourself because I'm not going. This is Abraham. He trusted and said, God has told me to move. God has told me to go. I don't know where he wants me to go. He hasn't given me those details. He hasn't given me all the answers to my questions, but he's told me to move, so I'm moving. In our life, so much we say, God, you want me to do this? You want me to do that? Okay. Oh, wait, God, show me the whole plan first. I got a few questions. If you answer a few questions for me first, then I'll do this. And sometimes he goes, no, I'm asking you to go. When you decide to go, I will start giving you answers. When you decide to move, I will start giving you clear direction. But right now, I'm just asking, do you trust me to move? Do you trust me to go? Do you trust me to do? Abraham had, had, to, had a time of, of just patiently waiting. God had told him that you were going to be the father of many nations, and yet he says at this old age, he still had no children, but God had promised him the son. Sarah, his wife, were, was well past the, the childbearing years, and yet God had said, and, God, and Abraham said, I'm going to wait. God promised, I have faith i have confidence and you know what it doesn't seem like it could be reality now because i'm getting to be an old man and sarah's not a spring chicken anymore and and so this i don't know how this is going to be real but but this is going to work because god has said it was going to work then when he gives him his son isaac then god says okay now i want you to sacrifice isaac to me seriously god Abraham's life was full of trust and full of waiting. By faith, by his confidence, he trusted God. And that kind of faith sometimes is hard because that faith, the faith that's pleasing to God, will enable us to be patient. This faith, what will please God is a faith that allows us to be patient, to wait for him, to trust in him. I, I love this example that the author gave us. In, in verse 23, it says, By faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. By faith, the parents of Moses, by faith, what did they do? They did action. They did something. They risked. They took risk. By faith, Moses' parents, because of their confidence in the things that were invisible and in, in, in putting their trust in God, they took risk. He said, I don't understand this. You have to understand. The, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt at that time, the leader of Egypt at that time, had decided he didn't want any more boys born into this, this region. And so he said, if any, any child that is born that is a boy, this is literally what you have to do. You have to take that child, you have to throw him into the river and let them drown. Well, Moses' parents, I love what the scripture said here, is they noticed that they knew that he wasn't just any ordinary child. They knew that God had a great plan for his life. So you know what they did? They took Moses, they put him in a basket, and they did what the, what the Pharaoh said. They put him in the river, but they put him in this basket, and they hid him. For three months, they hid him. They, one day, they, they took him, and they put him in this basket, and they hid him in the river, in the reeds, hiding him from, from, from this, the, the Pharaoh and his, and his leaders and his soldiers. And it says, one day, Pharaoh's own daughter found Moses, took Moses in, and actually raised him and took care of him. Do you look at the, you look at the, the faith of Moses' parents? They saw, they knew that, that there was something special about Moses. They just, they just knew this, and they said, you know, we're going to take a risk. We know that our lives are in danger. We know that, that we are taking risks because we are absolutely defying the edict that was given to us by Pharaoh. But they believed that God was going to take care of them. They had confidence that God was going to protect them. They trusted that there was something special for the life of Moses. So by faith, they took risk. Then we get the, the, the story of, of Joshua in verse 30. It doesn't mention his name, but it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Joshua, the leader at that time, Joshua had faith. What Joshua did in his faith, the action that it produced, was that he marched. I said, well, that's not very difficult, is it? He walked. Ooh, I could do that. That's what he did. He walked. See, God told Joshua, he said, I'm going to give you the city of Jericho. 
I'm going to give you that victory. I'm going to give you that city. And so Joshua probably went to him, okay, God, how are we going to do this? We're going to invade them at night. We're going to bring the airstrike in. We're going to bring bombs in. What, what, what are we going to do, God? How are we going to do this? He said, this is what I want you to do. You're going to walk around the city. Okay, God, well, we're going to walk around and do like a little recognizance a couple days and kind of figure out where the weaknesses are. Then we're going to go in for the attack. He said, I want you to march around the city for six days. On six days, march around one time. And then on the seventh day, seventh day, you're going to march around it seven times. And on the seventh time, you're going to have the, 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 the band is going to be in front, those fierce bands. You're going to have the band in front. And the band is going to blow their horns. And you're going to cry out to the name of the Lord. And the city walls are going to come crumbling down. Now, if I'm Joshua, like the head coach, the leader, you know, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's our game plan today. We're going to go walk around the city. Okay, okay, coach, that's great. What, what we do? Then the band is going to be in front of us. Band, okay, band. Band's going to be in front of us. We're going to walk around it six times on day seven. And then on the seventh time on day seven, the band is going to begin to play really loud. Oh, okay, they're going to play loud, they're going to charge it up, and we're going to charge in, right? No, they're going to play loud, and you're going to yell out the name of the Lord. Okay, that's what we're going to do. They did, by faith, they marched around. Now, can you imagine the people in that city of Jericho? The city had, had walls, that means it was a very fortified city, it was a very protected city, so it would have had soldiers on the top of that wall. That means it would have had guards on the top of that wall. Can you imagine being those guards? Walking in our day one, like, who's that group of people? Yeah, I don't know. Like day two or three, by this time, they're like telling all their guard buddies, you got to come see these people. you got to look at these. Look at these guys. They're just walking around, you know. Day seven, they're probably like, oh, there they go. Hey, man, they're going twice. <laughs> Do a little extra exercise. They're getting twice around today. Three times. Hey, guys, come up here. All the guards are looking, standing on top of the wall, trying to figure out, what are they doing? What are they? I mean, like I said, and all of a sudden, seven times, they begin to hear the trumpets blow. And they're probably, maybe the guard maybe just laughing at what, what, they're, going to, they're going to play some music now. All of a sudden, the trumpets begin to blow, and all of a sudden, the rocks underneath their feet, the walls begin to crumble, and they begin to fall down, and they are defeated by these leaders and these people of Joshua. Why? Because Joshua's action was, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. Even if it seems absurd, I'm going to, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. We're going to walk around and march. And in doing that, God gave them the victory. Do we have that kind of faith? To do things that we may even seem to be absurd, would we do it? By faith, it says in, in verse 32, he begins to list, I don't have time to, to list all of these people, he says, but, but look at these people. He says Gideon and, and Barak and Samson, Japheth, Japheth and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms. They, they, they conquered kingdoms. They fought. By faith, these people, the, these people fought and conquered things. They did things. They, they went out and, and fought the battles that no one else would want to fight. I look at two of those and I think of them. And he mentions David. And I think about David when he was just a young boy. He, 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 was, he was taking care of his father's sheep one day. His older brothers were all in battle. They were all in the Israelite army at war against the Philistines. David is out taking care of sheep because he's the youngest one at home. And he's out there taking care of his sheep, out there taking care of the flock, and his dad comes to him and says, hey, I need you to take some meals, I need you to take some food, I need you to take some supplies to your brother and the rest of the army at the battlefront. He says, okay, so he gathers them up, he goes them up, and he makes the journey to, to where the, the camp of the Israelites are, and he goes there, and all of a sudden, he comes there and he sees what's been happening day after day. This giant of a Philistine warrior named Goliath, who's been coming out day after day, looking at the Israelite army and say, hey, who's going to come fight me? And every single day, the Israelite army, David, his brothers, and the rest of the soldiers would hide in fear from Goliath. He would come out day after day and defy God and curse God. And none of the Israelite, none of God's people would stand up against him. None of them were willing to fight that fight. David comes, he's bringing all these supplies. He hears this guy coming up. He hears Goliath come out and defy God and say, hey, you big wimps, who wants to come out and fight me? And no one will do it. And David begins to question it. And like a good older brother would do, his brother's looking and says, what are you even doing here? What, what, shouldn't you be out taking care of the sheep or something? This is man's business. Go do your thing. And David, I love David's response. Because if you read the story, David says, hey, what did I do? 
I'm just bringing you some food. That's the guy that you should be mad at. David says, you know what? If you guys aren't going to do it, I'll go out. David goes to the general, to the king, Saul, and says, I'll go out and fight this guy because no one else is willing to fight this guy. And they're like, hey, you aren't even a trained warrior. You're just a youth. You're so small. He is going to destroy you. He says, I'm going to do it by faith. I know God's going to give me this victory. I'm willing to fight this fight even though no one else is because I have faith, trust, and confidence in God who's going to protect me and take care of me. Saul tries to give him all of his warrior, all of his armor, and says, here, maybe this will at least protect you. He, David can't even move in it. He says, I don't need this. He's just going to take what he's comfortable with, what he knows. And that's his slingshot from being out there in the fields with the sheep, protecting those sheep with that slingshot. He takes that slingshot. He goes out and begins to stand in front of Pharaoh, in front of um, Goliath. And Goliath looks at him and mocks him. Goliath says, what are you guys sending out to me? After all these days, this is what you give me? He finally gets so mad, he says, come here, boy. I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air. So David begins to walk out there. Now, if Goliath is this, David's brothers, David's brothers are like hiding. They're like hiding behind the tents right now. They're like scared. They're in fear. They don't know what's going on. They're like, oh, this is going to be bad. How are we going to explain this to dad? Man, this is going to be horrible. And, uh, and all of a sudden, David glows out there. He looks at, at Goliath. And he says, I'm going to defeat you in the name of God. Takes that slingshot, begins to swirl with that rock, and it lets it go. It lands into the middle of Goliath's head. He drops to the ground. And then David walks up to him. I love this part. If you read the story, David walks up to him takes his own sword, Goliath's sword, which is large, big, probably as big as David. He pulls it out and cuts off the head of Goliath. Now, if I'm David, I don't know if he did this, but if I'm David and my stupid brothers had mocked me like that, I think David probably did this. Cut off the head, turned to look at his brothers and said, who's the man now? That's what I would have done, just saying by faith, David fought battles that no one was willing to fight. He mentioned Gideon. He said Gideon conquered kingdoms. I love the story of Gideon. Israelite, Israel is being oppressed and bullied by this nation called Midian and the Midianites. The Midianites have come in and they are stealing all the crops that the Israelites are growing. They're stealing all of their livestock. They're stealing all their animals. They literally or truly are just, just bullying and, and oppressing the Israelites. And Israel cries out to God. You find the story in, Josh, in Judges chapter 6, 7, and 8. You find the story of Gideon, and, and the Israelite is crying out to God. They're saying, God, would you please just set us free from the oppression of these Midianites? So God hears their cry and hears their prayers, and he sends an angel, a messenger, to this man named Gideon. Now Gideon is down in this wine press, which is like a hole, and he's hiding down in that hole with his wheat, and he's trying to harvest his wheat. He's hiding in there because he's scared. Not a very courageous man. This angel appears to him and says, hey, Gideon, God has heard the cry of your people, and he's choosing you to be the one to lead people this nation in the battle in the fight against the Midianites and Gideon says you talking to me the story says is that Gideon says I'm the weak this, this my family is the weakest of all the families of the Israelites I'm the youngest in my family so I'm the runt of the weakest family why are you choosing me why what makes you think I can do this and the angel says God has confidence in you and God will give you this victory Gideon takes that, and by faith, he goes out and he begins to recruit. He does a great job recruiting. He recruits 32,000 soldiers to fight against this battle. But you're talking about 32,000 against a legion of Midianite soldiers and warriors. And, and Gideon says, I don't know this really isn't enough, but God says that we have the victory, so we're going to go into battle. He comes before God, and God says, great job recruiting, Gideon. 32,000 people, that's awesome. But Gideon, that's too many. Too many? You see the size of the Midianite army? You know how big? That's too many. I want you to do this. I want you to go and tell them, any of them that want to go home, any of them that don't want to do this, any of them that are a little scared, it's fine, it's okay, they're free to go right now. So Gideon stands before his 32,000 and gives that message. 22,000 of them go home. He's left with 10. Can you see the, the lump in Gideon's throat? He's, okay, God, there's what we got left, 10,000. He goes, okay, um, that's still too many. I want you to take them, we're going to do this test. I want you to take them down to the river. 
We're going to divide them into two groups. The group of people who stick their head down into the river to get a drink and the group of people who scoop the water up with their head up and drink out of their hands. This group that, that, that keeps their head up and drinks out of their hands, that's the group that I want you to keep because that's a way, kind of a symbol of their readiness all the time, their attentiveness. So okay, so we do this. They, 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 they go down and, and Gideon sees all this and he splits them up into two groups by, by that test and there's only 300 in the group that he's going to keep. And God says, okay, there's your army. 300 now against them? Because what God told him, he says, I am going to take this down to just a few. Because I want Israel to realize that I am the one that gave them that victory. That it wasn't in their own strength. It wasn't in their own numbers. It wasn't in their own great battle strategies. It was me that gave them the victory. It looks absurd, but I'm telling you, I'm going to give you this victory. So Gideon takes his 300. And one night, they find the Midianite army camped out in this valley. Gideon divides his 300 into three companies. So they have 100 people in each company surrounding this area. And he goes to give them their weapons. Now, if I'm part of that 300, I'm thinking, there's only a few of us, so, man, we've got to get some really good state-of-the-art technology weapons. This is going to be great. Gideon begins to pass them out their weapons, and he gives them a trumpet. I don't know what it is with horn players and God. I don't know what it is. He gives them a trumpet and a clay pot with a lantern inside. He says, here's our weapons for this battle. Seriously? Oh, yeah, God told us it was him giving us the victory, right? They take those clay pots, they surround that valley. They break open the clay pots so that the light dispels the darkness in the middle of the night. And they blow their horns. And the scriptures say that they yell out the name of the Lord. And this incredible, absurd thing happens. That huge Midianite army, when they get so confused by this light that's coming from all around them and the sounds of that trumpet and the people yelling out the name of the Lord, it says that God caused this confusion in that valley. And all of a sudden, the Midianites started fighting each other and they start destroying and killing each other. And those 300 people defeat the entire Midianite army because of their faith in God. Because they were willing to fight battles that no one else was willing to fight in a way that no one else ever would. 300 against them with a trumpet and a clay pot. I'm not going to that fight. But they had faith in God. By faith, they fought the way God wanted them to fight. You see, faith frees us up to do the absurd. The things that people look at and say, that makes no sense at all. Why do you live your life that way? That makes no sense by faith. Confidence and trust in God. Why do you choose to do this? Why do you take those kind of risks? Why, why do you just wait? By faith. One last scripture. If you turn just a few pages to the next book in James. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Look at verse 14 with me. It says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, no action? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Can you imagine us going to the parks yesterday? going to the parks yesterday and meeting with these kids and meeting with these people and saying, hey, I just want to, I hope you have a great Christmas. Let me pray for you. Let me, let me, I just hope that you have a great Christmas. I just want to pat you on the back. Good Christmas. Oh, well, we didn't do anything. We, did, we, just, we just came. I see that you have needs, but we didn't do anything about it. I see that you're hungry, but we didn't do anything about it. I see you need clothes, but we didn't do anything about it. I see you need a special blessing in your life, but we didn't do anything about it. Look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, I have actions. Show me your faith without deeds or actions, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did and the scripture was fulfilled and says Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute 
considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds, action is dead. This section of Scripture can be so misunderstood at times. That this section of Scripture can be so kind of taken out of context. Let me tell you this. He is not saying here that faith without works isn't faith. Because that, that he's, he's not saying, he, he's not saying, let me say this, faith does not exist if there's not some kind of action coming out of it. Now that action, those works do not bring on faith. Those actions, those works don't create faith in your life. It's the faith that you have. If you really believe in these things, if you truly have trust and confidence in God, guess what? As we said from the very beginning, faith is an initiator. Faith initiates movement. Faith initiates action. Real faith, biblical faith, real trust and confidence in God puts you into action. And so if you look at someone's life who claims to have a relationship with Christ, who claims to trust and believe and have confidence in Christ, yet they're not doing anything, I personally am going to question their faith. It's not my job to question. It's not my place. But I'm going to look on the outside and go, hey, if you say you have faith, if you say you trust in God, if you say you have this confidence, if that faith is really initiating things in your life, See, where there's no movement, there is no action. Where there is no action, I don't believe there's any real faith. Because see, here's the thing. Real biblical faith produces action. But just action, that's just religion. And it's much more about a relationship than it is religion. So begin to think about this. Faith initiates us doing good faith initiates us doing deeds faith initiates movement in our life faith not only initiates us doing good and doing these things these actions but faith initiates personal change in us that faith should initiate things of me changing in me my attitudes my actions my choices my decisions my values my faith changes those things like I said, faith, faith frees us up to do the absurd. Faith looks into the future because we know that's where the greatest reward is found. Faith looks into the future and says, if I do this, I can take this step because there may be risk, there may be patience, I may have to wait some, but I know if I do in faith, if I have this faith, there is a great reward ahead of me. There are promises of God that he is going to fulfill, and he may not fulfill those things here on this earth for me, but he's given me an incredible eternity in heaven where he will fulfill all those things. By faith, by faith, what for you? By faith, you do. By faith, you trust. By faith you go. By faith you fight. By faith what? Confidence. Confidence in something that we can't put our hands around. A faith that is better than anything here on earth. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to ask you this. If you, like many of you would, say that I'm a Christian, I ask you to think and to look inside your life and say, my faith is causing me to do what? Is faith for you, this this trust, this believing God, just a security blanket? Because your faith, your trust, your confidence in God should cause you to move. It should initiate movements in your life. It should initiate personal change in you and the person you are. It should initiate some some action out of your life because you are doing things because of your faith. So there's a starting point here that I want everyone to understand. 
the starting point is what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. See, the scriptures tell us that we're all sinners. We all do things and have things in our life that do not measure up to God's standards. Those things in our life are called sin. That sin has separated us from God. Because God being a holy God cannot be in relationship with sin, but he wants to be in relationship with us as his creation. So he said there had to be a sacrifice. We've talked about it for several weeks, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his blood being shed on the cross. And Jesus Christ came and gave his life as he was nailed to the cross and put in a tomb and rose again. Those actions were because of your sins and my sins. And the scriptures teach us this, that if I would come into a point in my personal life that I would accept and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he had to do that for me personally, if I would confess my sins before him, he says that he is faithful, he is just, and will forgive us our sins and give us an eternal life in heaven with him. He'll bring us into relationship with him and give us eternity in heaven. Maybe for you, you've never had that starting point. I want to invite you right now that, that if you've never had that time, that moment in your life, that right now, sitting in that seat where you're at right now, you could have a conversation with God. Not a verbal conversation that we can all hear, just a conversation in your heart and your mind with God. And you could settle this. You could accept the greatest gift that's ever offered, and that is salvation through Jesus Christ. You could have a conversation or prayer just like this. You could say, dear God, I believe in you. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come and live in my life as my Savior. God, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for forgiveness.